All right, so you have your lesson. Everybody has a lesson, right? Lesson number 10. Does anybody need a lesson for tonight? Everybody has it. Yes, that's the one with Jesus on the cover. That is the one. Okay, so let's do our quiz. All right. Oh, I forgot. I'm going to talk a little bit about archaeology. Yeah, I forgot about that. So we're going to look at how many have ever, ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, well, this is what we're going to look at briefly. I only have uh, maybe six or seven slides on this, on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the Essenian community of Qumran, the Essenes were first century Jews. Uh, they lived in the Dead Sea. It's, I said the other night, it is dry as a bone. This is on. Yeah, this is on. Very dry, very rocky. Uh, they lived there. The Essenes were sort of like, um, <laughs> I, first name that came to my mind was the, the Branch Davidian Compound in Waco, Texas. <laughs> it's the first thing that came to my mind. Because these people, it was a community, it was a tight community, but they were in their own compound. They wanted to separate from the rest of the Jewish community because they thought they wanted to be pure they wanted to follow the righteous teacher and they were preparing for the end of the world and in order to do that you have to be pure and so they established their own compound <laughs> their commune uh, i'm not saying they were moral but they uh, but they lived in in this place they practiced celibacy some of them generally pacifist in nature um, they were jewish separatists is what i've been I'm saying because um, they believe that most jews were just Average Joes, they were not really walking the walk as we still today say, the Christians, okay? So that's why they, they believed in them and they were preparing for a great war. Um, although they believed everything is preordained by God, they also acknowledged free will, hence their constant efforts to purify themselves. You can't really blame them, right? You can't blame these people. I mean, their motive was they wanted to be pure, they wanted to be ethical, and they wanted to be ready for the end of the world. Is that so bad? That's not so bad. The problem is, there's one major problem with that, is that they became separatists. Jesus is the most holy and righteous one ever, and did he separate from the brethren? Nope, quite the opposite. People would say things like, oh, he eats and drinks with sinners. <laughs> he hung around with the wrong crowd. He definitely did not separate himself from the dirty and corrupt. He didn't go into a commune at all. So that's the big difference between them and Jesus. Okay, so these are caves, and scholars have named these caves, or numbered, excuse me, these caves. And... Uh, the Essenes, they believe that the Essenes were, Essenes were the ones that wrote these scrolls. And the reason why it's called the Dead Sea is because this is the northwestern, or north, northwestern part, I think, I'm maybe mistaken, of, of the Dead Sea. So it's very dry and arid, which is perfect if you want to preserve something, right? There's no moisture. Um, the worst thing that can happen to your photos and important documents at home is water, <laughs> is moisture. That's the worst thing. But if it is dry as a bone, stuff can last forever. And so um, they were hidden in these caves, as you can see in this picture. Uh, teen shepherds accidentally one day discovered the scrolls in 1947. One teen tossed a rock into a cave opening and he heard, oh, what's that? And he went in to investigate. And it was a jar. And uh, I'm going to show you a picture of that jar in a minute. And so the family sold the discovery to an antiquities dealer. The scrolls ended up in the hands of scholars and institutions, and they were like, wow, this is the greatest find of the 20th century in biblical scholarship. It really is. It's not an exaggeration. Very, very important find. Okay, so here's some of the jars. The actual clay jars, you know how in good shape they are? Some of them are broken. If you see in pictures of museums, you'll see cracks and, you know, the, these people... The, they just put them back together, glue them together. But that's what the scrolls are. The Isaiah scroll, you are looking at the real Isaiah scroll. It's housed in a huge, I don't think I have a picture. It's housed in a, in its own 
mausoleum of sorts in Jerusalem, uh, in Jerusalem, the Isaiah scroll. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, what they found were scrolls like this, and they would find fragments, pieces of manuscripts. The Isaiah scroll is the most complete one of everything that they found. The other thing that they found, not only did they find every single book of the Bible, not the New Testament, but every single book of the Bible, with the exception of Esther, if I'm not mistaken, with the exception of Esther, every single one, even the book of Daniel, and Isaiah is the most complete one of them all. Okay, that's the Isaiah scroll. You're looking at the original scroll right there. So this is what a manuscript, a fragment looks like. Can somebody tell me why it's called 4Q51? Yes, it's the fourth cave. So I said they numbered those caves. So 4 Qumran cave, manuscript 51. That's how they, they document these things. And uh, I can't see quite the picture, but it's gotta be in Greek. It looks like, who knows, I can't, I can't even read it. I can read Greek, but I can't read that one. Okay, now, um, I, wish, I can go on and on about this, but here's the important thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some people have wondered, how do you know what you're reading today is what the actual authors wrote in the Bible? For example, Daniel. How do you know? Because we have not one single original copy. They don't exist. So we have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, copies. So these scrolls, some of them were written in the second century BC. Yes. That means that's 2,200 years old. So here's the amazing thing about it. Even though those manuscripts were, some of them were written in, in, uh, in the second century BC, um, they match pretty good with our modern Bibles. Now that is amazing. That is just amazing. That gives you an idea. There's always little marginal notes and little uh, copyist errors, etc. There's always that stuff, but nothing of a major significance. And so it gives you a reason why we can be confident in our Bible. We didn't pass these quiz outs. Oh, thank you so much, Les. You're so kind. Okay, so we're going to take a quiz. Answer this to, your, to yourself. The little horn of Daniel 7 has not yet come. That sounds like a tricky one. The little horn of Daniel 7 has not yet come. Okay, so is that true or false? The little horn of Daniel 7 has not yet come. Okay, number two. The little horn of Daniel 7 refers to a religious power that has mixed paganism and Christianity. So that's what we call PG, <laughs> Paganism and Christianity. So this little horn is rated PG, right? That's an easy way to remember it. The little horn is rated PG. Okay, number three, one of the most daring claims of the little horn power is that it thinks to change God's law. Is that true or false? One of the most daring claims that this little horn power makes. Number four, the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast of Revelation 13 refer to the same power. Okay, one in the same power. Question number five. The number 666 refers to a literal number to be written on everybody's forehead in the last days. I don't think we ever, oh, I don't think we talked about this and, and, and I don't remember if it's some notes written in the lesson. Um, but it refers to a literal number to be written on everybody's forehead in the last days. True or false? We did talk about it? I don't remember. You see how tired I am? <laughs> All right, number one, the little horn of Daniel 7 has not yet come. What is that? It's false. The little horn did come. And then the wound, the, one of its heads was wounded. Uh, the little horn persecuted people already in the past, so it did come. But uh, blasphemies, um, history has a tendency to uh, want to wake up again and do the same thing all over again. And uh, so this is what's going to happen. Number two, the little horn of Daniel 7 refers to a religious power that has mixed paganism and Christianity. Is the little horn rated PG, yes or no? That's true, yes, he's rated PG. Number three. One of the most daring claims of the little horn power is that it thinks to change God's law. True or false? True. That's true. Okay, that is true. In fact, uh, I don't have a bulletin, but in my church bulletin, 
in our church, my church, ours, I put, has, can anybody really, can anybody change God's law? And I put, you'll read it tomorrow, I put, well, actually, yes, it's proven in history because man has changed it. But God has a different view of that. <laughs> So man can change it and he can do all he wants. He can manipulate the law and everything. and that's, that's what happened in history. But in heaven, it really, really hasn't changed. Number four, the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast of Revelation 13 refer to the same power. True or false? True. It's true because they have very, very, they have the same traits. They're just described in different wording as is the nature of the Bible and the nature of apocalyptic prophecy. But, um, and this is where you have to really put on your thinking cap and look at the sequence of events. If you look at the sequence of events, they both match the same time era. Okay, number five, 666 refers to a literal number and it's going to be stamped on your forehead in the last days. True or false? False. Okay, that's false. If that is false, then who cares if you have a number 666 in your social security card? Nobody. Who cares? Or in your license number? You have it in your social security? I'm going to tell you a story from the street. There was a, uh, somebody told me about this. They signed a, a number for their license. They had a number for their license. Oh. Oh, oh dear. Oh, dear. Yeah, there's no, there's no reason. To, yeah, there's no reason to be scared because if in your heart you worship Jesus, I mean, hey, did John Huss, John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, they received these firebolts of, of, of false accusations and and blasphemy and ruining their character and saying that they're heretics, etc. Did they become a heretic because other people said they were heretics? Of course not. So who cares? It's, it's what's in here in the heart. Okay, today's lesson, can the little horn change God's law? Yes or no? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, here's a quick review. Jesus is central to all prophecy. That's because Jesus is the one that gives prophecy, gives it to his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives it to his servants, the prophets. So uh, it, it originates with Christ. And the subject matter is about a great controversy between Christ and Satan. The very, the very foundational subject matter, if you look at the umbrella picture of it, because it's easy to get lost in the details. Little horn, ten horns, seven heads, four wings, blah, blah, blah. blah. You get lost in that stuff. It's easy. But the big picture, you've got to remember, Christ is at the helm. Amen? And then the second thing, a great controversy exists. I just said that. The issues are over worship, true versus false, and obedience. It, it's always that. It's, it's always that. It doesn't matter what time we live in. And there has been a major apostasy from truth. There has been a major apostasy from truth. Now, if you happen to be on the side of right and you haven't been duped by this apostasy, you better not be proud of it. Don't get a big head because of that. Because the Jews, the ancient Jews, they, uh, in fact, Paul says, theirs are the prophets, theirs are the covenants, theirs are the gifts, theirs are the prophecies, theirs is Abraham. They had everything, but they became proud and obstinate and arrogant, and God bypassed them. So let's not let that go to our head. God's faithful end-time commandment keepers will be in the minority. They will. They've always been, really. They've always been, which is one of the things that just kind of irks some sometimes. Number six, God will not take us out of tribulation. He will go through trials and tribulation with us. What is the most popular psalm that you could think of. Which one? 23rd. 23rd psalm. What does it say? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David doesn't say, and when I'm about to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you rescue me from it. And you put me high on a mountaintop. No. Daniel had to go through a den of lions. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to go through a big firing kiln. All of these guys had to go through tribulations, but God walked with them and he saved them. Number seven, ultimately there will be a death decree, okay, for those who worship the true God, okay? So um, let's go on into our lesson. I want to read a couple of things in your introduction. Look at number two in your lesson, page two. Number two, ancient Babylon, and I skip a few lines here and there. Ancient Babylon has become symbolic of mighty spiritual Babylon in the book of Revelation. Literal Babylon existed in the book of Daniel. Spiritual Babylon, literal Babylon is long gone by the time Revelation comes, but there's a spiritual aspect of it. In lesson nine, we learn that Daniel predicted the rise of the little horn that would lead the church to mix truth with error. Number three says, Daniel has also revealed to us that God's people will be able to resist the apostasy and stand victorious with Jesus in the great controversy because they have a deep abiding relationship with Jesus. That is, that is uh, utmost. Daniel 6 emphasizes the importance of Christians taking time with God in Bible study and prayer. Because remember, Daniel prayed a lot. We must know what God's word says for ourselves. And then below that it says, the little horn emerges as one of the chief antagonists in this great controversy because it is the instrument through which apostasy has entered the Christian church. We will soon see that Satan, through the little horn, has endeavored to sever the relationship between God and his people. If you notice in Daniel 7, you have all these horrifying beasts. Now in Daniel 7, God didn't say the, uh, the, uh, the bear. In Daniel 7, he didn't say the bear represents the Medes and the Persians. He didn't say the, uh, the horrible, uh, he didn't, the leopard. He didn't say the leper represents Greece. And he didn't say that ugly T-Rex sort of animal represents Rome. He was not given the identification of those animals. And yet, after Daniel saw the vision, what does he want to know most about? The little horn. If you read Daniel 7, that's what is utmost in his mind. I am really interested in this the guy more than the other beasts because of the things that this little horn is doing. So it surpasses the blasphemies and the war against the Most High and the persecution of the saints. It surpasses the other ones because there's a lot of attention in Daniel 7 given to the little horn more than the others. It's very, very interesting. So if I use the word Elisa to you a thousand times tonight, do you think Elisa is important for me? Do you think I'm trying to emphasize Elisa? <laughs> There's an emphasis on the little horn in Daniel 7. And uh, so it merits attention. Okay, so number one, what specifically would the little horn think to change? Let's look at the answer. And think to change times and laws. Think to change times and laws. Though it's impossible, yet this little horn power thinks it has the power uh, to do exactly that. And then it says here in the note, note also that it would think to change not just the law, but the times and the law. One of the key thoughts we have noticed already in Daniel is the need to take time with God. And um, uh, my mind has been all over the place, but um, I really wanted to share with you, if I remember, how this linguistically, this can be intimately connected, times and law, with, uh, with the time and law of the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, the only time really that is specified in there is, is the Sabbath. So let's go to number two. How many commandments are in God's law? Quick, how many, many, many? Ten. Oh, good. Whew. I was a little worried about there. You were taking too long to answer. <laughs> okay, there are ten of them, and there they are. And there's Moses. There's Charlton Heston right there, <laughs> splitting the Red Sea. <laughs> Okay, I remember when I was a kid, uh, must have been I was 12, 11 years old, and they used to show the Ten Commandments around Easter time, I think, on TV. We had our big cabinet TV, remember those big cabinet ones? And it would be exciting. We'd get our vanilla ice cream and, 
and we'd all sit down and we watched it. This was before the advent of DVDs and all this stuff or YouTube. And it was just exciting. Yes, it's that time of year again. We could see the Ten Commandments. I, used to, I love that movie still. Number three, what is so special about these Ten Commandments? What did you, what did you all write in those blanks? They were written by the finger of God. That's right. They were written with the finger of God. The writing was the writing of God. It's interesting, he didn't, God didn't use a pen. <laughs> he just, <laughs> right in the granite. <laughs> His finger's like an engraver. I mean, it's just no problem for him. But that's what's special about them. Look at the note below question number three. The Ten Commandments are the only part of the Bible that God himself wrote with his own finger. The rest of scripture was written by the prophets as God communicated with them. Some will say, oh, the exception is when Jesus wrote in the sand or in the, on the, the hard ground. The Ten Commandments were of such vital importance that God wrote them with his own finger on tablets of stone. This indicated their permanency, a writing on stone, right? If you're going to write something that wants to last, then you won't write paper. Otherwise, you'll take care of it. And if you had the tools to burn it in wood, even better. But if you had a granite stone, how long do you think that's going to last? So it is very telling that God wants to write this on a rock. <laughs> it's significant. All right, so let's go over the Ten Commandments. How well do you know them? Well, let's test your knowledge. Okay, here's a fact. If you break one commandment, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, you are guilty of breaking them all. And some may say, you know, scratch your heads. Well, how do you figure that? I mean, if I, if I um, covet, if I'm breaking the 10th commandment, that's coveting, but I go to church on Sabbath. Friday night, I keep the Sabbath. So how am I breaking the Sabbath if I, you know, if I covet? Well, according to this verse, if you break one commandment, you're guilty of breaking them all. <laughs> so there's, there's some spiritual, uh, very deep undergirdings that connect the commandments together more than we realize. I'm human. We're all human. So they're intimately connected with each other more than we realize or more than we give them credit for, really. Yeah, Jesus said, yep, mm -hmm, that the saints will keep all the commandments. Okay, and here's another fact. If God could have changed the commandments, Jesus would not have needed to die on the cross. Now tell me why. Put your thinking caps on. It's not a trick question. If God could have changed the commandments, Jesus wouldn't need to have died. Why is that? What was that? There would have been no sin. If God could change that commandment, coveting commandment, oh, Ray, you're coveting all the time. All right, I'll just erase it. Then I'm no longer guilty of breaking it. Therefore, Jesus doesn't have to die for me because I'm innocent, right? So the very fact that Jesus died on the cross proves beyond a shadow of a doubt they are binding as God put his finger on that rock. <laughs> all right, here's another fact. The cross saves, not the law. The law just shows us our need of the cross. I love this statement by Dwight Moody. He says, the law, the, he says, the law shows me how broken I am. This is what Dwight Moody says. The law shows me how broken I am. Grace came along and straightened me out. That's, good. That's what he says, Dwight Moody. I have it in my office. And another fact, but you say, I can't do it. John 1.12, you read John 1.12. Um, John 1, 12. That might be a mistake. It might be in 1 John. Because the first in verse John says, and the commandments of God are not burdensome. But this may be saying something else. Somebody look up John 1, 12 while I keep on going at these slides and tell me what it says. I know what verse 11 says. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, what is the first commandment? I have no other gods before me. Well, yeah, look at all those other gods I put on the screen. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. John 1, 12, that as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. Oh, okay. To, many, to those who received Jesus, he gave them the right to become uh, children of God. Okay. 
thou shalt have no other gods before me. And that just doesn't, that doesn't mean just statues and relics and crucifixes and manipul manipulatable objects. Um, gods can stand for abstractings too. Number five, question five, what does the second commandment prohibit? Yep, idols. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. It's interesting, this word image, at least in, the, in Greek, in the, when you get to the New Testament, the word in Greek is icon. So we get the name icon from. Oh, interesting. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, the Taliban, where the iconoclasts, they were com which is a person who completely believes that idols are evil. That's why the Taliban was, were, they were going all, remember they were going all over the place, destroying things. They destroyed the, supposedly the birthplace of Jonah and historians and scholars all over the world. No, <laughs> they were destroying all of these, all of these things. Yeah, iconoclast, but uh, that's where in the New Testament uh, icons, but that's the second commandment. All right. What does the third commandment say? According to verse seven in Exodus 20. That's right. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay? So if I stub my toe, oh, JC. <laughs> People will do that sometimes. But it goes way beyond that, doesn't it? If I say I'm a Christian and I live like the devil, don't you think I'm taking the name of Jesus in vain? Of course I am. Number, what? Yes, I did oh, today. OMG. You see that all over the place. OMG, OMG, OMG. Like God, the name God doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just part of pop culture. The name God is just, it's a pop culture thing. Number seven. What, do, what, Les? Even children say. Yeah, even children say, oh my God. Oh man. Once in a great while, I'll say, oh, God, but it's because I see a horrible accident. And I'm sensing like, oh, God, please help this person. You know, that's a lot different than just saying it flippantly. Number seven, what does the fourth commandment require of people? What say ye? That's right. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The only commandment that uses that word remember, the only one. So if I tell Les, hey, Les, remember we went fishing two years ago? And you'll say, huh? Yeah. Well, why would I use the word remember if it doesn't refer to something you and I did in the past? Or something I gave you or something you gave me. Remember? You ever, you ever reminisce with your spouses or kids or remember, remember this, remember, remember that trip we made? Well, obviously the assumption is because there was an experience in the past, so it's nothing new. So this fourth commandment is nothing new when it was written by God in Mount Sinai. What specifically are people to keep as the Sabbath day? The seventh day. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, right? The seventh day is the Sabbath. Okay, number nine. What commandment did God give to protect the family? Yes. Honor thy father and thy mother. Honestly, this one can be challenging sometimes for people who have grown up with abusive parents. This is extremely challenging. I've, I've, I've uh, sat in, in a counseling context with some people before and oh man, those tears are just coming out because there's guilt. I cannot bring myself to honor because of the bad things. My mom was a horrible mom, etc. And so, um, I'll just say this. I could be mistaken, but honoring a parent and respecting them, personally, I see a little bit of distinction there because it's hard to respect somebody who abused you. I remember talking to a Native American this was some years ago. He just knocked on my door. Once in a while, I'll get somebody who just knocks on the door if I'm here and he walks in. He wanted to talk to somebody. And uh, uh, 
he was he was my age he was crying like a baby like <laughs> crying like a baby recounting a particular religious persuasion leader that abused him horribly when he was a child sexually abused horribly horrible am i going to say oh you should honor that man he's going to say how can i honor him or how can i respect him anyways nevertheless those nuances and those things that we need to work out sometimes nevertheless this is what god says um so we don't go wanting to kill our parents <laughs> or talk back to them, because that's not honoring, talking back and shouting at them, that's not honoring. Let's go to number 10. What moral standards does God uphold in the last five of the Ten Commandments? Okay, let's look. Letter A, thou shalt not kill. The actual word is, has a, the, the connotation is murder. Um, murder and killing are different things. Even our law recognizes this. Manslaughter is when you kill somebody without the intent of murder. So uh -huh. murder is when you are thinking about it, you're digesting it, and you make plans, your motives and your plans are to kill and take a person's life deliberately. That's murder. And uh, my wife and I have gone to a few debates before talking about this and war. What's the difference between murder, this commandment, and war? When he says, I want to talk about this, because God commands war in the Old Testament. But he says, thou shalt not murder. So there, there is a distinction between killing and murder. Letter B, thou shalt not commit what? Adultery. adultery. What, letter, what number are we on? Okay, number 10. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Remember what Jesus says? You can commit adultery in your thoughts. In your thoughts. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Boy, I have when I took a, uh, a, a principles of Christian ethics class. I took it. I took it from uh, Samuel Pippin when I was in the seminary. He was one of my professors, Samuel Pippin, and um, and uh, I remember he 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 and Miroslav Kish was the. Uh, they were both uh, co-teaching, and I'll never forget. I still have my notes, my seminary notes where he gave us case studies to provoke discussion in our class. And it was all about what is your ethics when you're in a situation where you just got to steal something to save a life, for example, J just for example. And it provokes discussion, you know, is stealing right in certain circumstances? Is it always wrong? <laughs> what do you guys think, by the way? I think God knows everyone's heart and why. And okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Letter D, thou shalt not bear false witness. What does that mean? No yeah, no line. The full verse says, the full verse says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, against your neighbor. I know a pastor who once said, yeah, but it doesn't say you can bear false, it doesn't say you cannot bear false witness with somebody who's not your neighbor. <laughs> and we all said, oh, what? <laughs> In other words, uh, no, 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 this is what he said. He says, yeah, it says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, but it doesn't say you cannot bear false witness in favor of your neighbor. That's what he said. <coughs> the first person I think of is people who are hiding Jews during World War II. And they said, are you hiding Jews? Are you hiding Jews? No, no, I promise. And they're lying because they're between a wall upstairs. So is that okay? Because you're bearing false witness in favor of your neighbor. Anyways, uh, we all just kind of chuckled at that. What? Letter E. Thou shalt not what? Covet. Look at the note below number 12. God's law points out or reveals sin. In quoting the 10th commandment, Paul indicates that the law involved is the 10 commandment law. Now, um, let me just say this. Um, as far as sin is concerned, uh, well, no, it's, it's the next one, I'm sorry. Law and grace. What is sin? This is what I make a comment on. What is sin according to 1 John 3, 4? Okay, it's a transgression of the law. And I put the note, not merely a wrong act of commission or omission. Sin is a condition. 
So just remember that. Um, you know, you can remember like COC. Sin is not only a commission or omission, but it's condition. And sometimes we, you know, we need to remind ourselves of this. Because just because I'm not out stealing, I'm not dishonoring my mom, uh, my mom, my dad died, you know, just because I'm not doing those things doesn't mean that I don't have a sinful condition. My nature itself is sin. So sin goes beyond just the external outward acts, uh, uh, crimes against God that we do. It goes deeper. Sin is a condition of the heart. It's a state of being. It's a nature. It's a nature. Yeah. It's a nature. So that's, that's what the Bible, that, that's the holistic picture of sin. Just keep that in mind, okay? So let's think about this. If there's no law, there's no what? There's no transgression. If there's no law, there's still sin. So is what the Apostle Paul says. I know it sounds confusing. Paul says... There is still sin without the law, but there is no transgression. So, for example, uh, uh, be, before the Ten Commandments, before God wrote the Ten Commandments, a person who committed adultery, it was still sin in God's eyes. And let's say that person was ignorant of the Seventh Commandment. Let's just, for argument's sake, Let's say that person was ignorant of the seventh commandment, but they still committed adultery. That is still sin in God's eyes. But it doesn't have the nature of a transgression. Transgression is when you are conscious of that law and you break it. Now you're transgressing. And there's different words in the Bible, three or four. There's sin, iniquity, transgression, and there's another one. But, but those are the three main words that they all use for sin. So transgression has the nature of you are in the know and you still do it. That's transgression. So it's, it's serious, Les? Is it transgression after you find out that it's a law? Does it become transgression then? I think it becomes transgression when you become aware that you just broke God's law. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, so that's the nature of transgression. So when you become aware of what you did was sin, then you should confess it. Yeah, and then that's, that's transgression. And then it's transgression. Yeah, and in fact, even the Apostle Paul, see, this is interesting. I didn't mean to get into this, but this is really interesting. In, in Romans 7, Paul says things like, without the law, I wouldn't have known what coveting was, he says in Romans 7. But now that I know that what that the law says, thou shalt not covet, he says, sin revived and I died. And I'm thinking, Paul, wait a minute. You were taught by Gamaliel. You were the Pharisee of Pharisees. You were, the, you were blameless. You even tell, say yourself, as far as a Pharisee, as far as the human flesh is concerned, you were blameless. So how could you say when you discovered the law, you died? He already knew the law. He was perfect. He was a perfect Hebrew Pharisee. Perfect. As far as knowing the law and keeping the externals. So what Paul is talking about in Romans 7 is he discovered a de deeper root and uh, he gained a deeper understanding of sin than just don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And if you don't do those things, you're holy and you're in God's favor. He discovered something deeper than that. And so even Paul, who kept the law perfectly, and he says so, he kept the law perfectly, he really didn't when the Holy Spirit really touched his heart. And he was revived in a deeper way than ever before. Let's go. So if there's no law, there's no transgression. If there's no transgression, we do not need a savior. That's what you were saying, Diana. We don't need a savior because we didn't sin if there's, no, if there's no law. So law, transgression, sin, savior. Hence, the devil wants us to believe that the law was nailed to the cross. Okay? If it was nailed to the cross, really, um, then Jesus did it all. <laughs> Jesus kept the law for me 2,000 years ago. So, if I'm trying to keep the law, it's legalism. He already did it for me. I just need to appeal to his grace and his love. 
and claim the obedience that he did for me 2,000 years ago. It's, it's, it sounds attractive, it's a little distorted, but it's a dangerous distortion. Number 12, which law is it that points out sin? Which law is it that points out sin? If I had not known sin, but by the law thou shalt not covet. God's law points out or reveals sin. In quoting the 10th commandment, Paul indicates that the law involved is the 10th commandment law. In other words, so when it says, what law is it that points out sin? It's not the law of, you know, if I accidentally kill your ox. He's not talking about that law. He's not talking about the law of, you know, I'm a really poor person, but I can bring two pigeons instead of a sheep. He's not talking about that law. So Paul here is saying, the intent of this question is, Paul is saying, I had not known sin if it were not the, the law that says thou shalt not covet. Well, that's the Ten Commandments. So the law we're talking about here is the Ten Commandments. Number 13. Is grace an excuse for sin? Is grace an excuse for sin? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, God forbid. I think some version, versions say, certainly not. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, no way. He says that, no way. Number 14, what is the purpose of God's law? According to Romans 3 and verse 20. Ah, to know what sin is. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Notice, Paul does not say by the law is the gaining of salvation. Doesn't say that. It's knowledge. The law is knowledge-based. It is not faith-based. And again, Paul says this. He says the law is not based on faith. Otherwise, then where does Jesus come into play? Jesus is taken out of the picture because you're having faith in the law. No, it's not faith-based, the law. It's knowledge-based. Um, I asked my wife earlier before coming out because, you know, even clean out there, hey, how's my hair look? You know, the, the 2200 that I have left. And she says, it looks okay. I didn't have a mirror. Or at least I didn't take time. So... Why do you go to a mirror? See what you look like. And if you have a smudge here, uh, you know, if you look like alfalfa, <laughs> you know, then you're going to fix yourself up, right? So the law does not do the fixing up for you. Can't do that. The law, uh, the mirror, uh, the law, the mirror cannot fix you up. The mirror only gives you knowledge of who you are. That's all it does. It's just a reflector of who you are. That's what the law does. It can't fix you. It just shows you, but cannot fix you. You need to remember those important distinctions. Number 15, how only can the Christian be cleansed? It says here, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So you see, the law does not cleanse. The law informs, the blood transforms. The law informs, the blood transforms. And this is all actuated by faith in His grace. Okay? Number 16, how then are people saved? According to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, many of you have read this many times before. By grace... Are you saved through faith, not of works? Those are the two words you need to use to fill in those blanks, grace and works. By grace we're saved. The New Testament is crystal clear. People are saved solely by what Jesus Christ does for them, His grace. Law-keeping and good works are the result of a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, but never a means to obtaining that relationship. That's never a means, right? Okay. Let's go to the Old Testament, Let's speed through this, number 17. Did God give the Ten Commandments to Israel before or after he saved them from Egypt? What say ye? After. after. He gave it to them after. Okay. I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, 
If you will obey my voice, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of, land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's in Exodus 19, verses 4 and 5. That's Exodus 19. In what chapter are the Ten Commandments? Exodus 20. Exodus 20. So he's telling them, hey, I saved you guys. So follow me, because I saved you, right? I lifted you up like wings on wings of eagles. And the note below question number 17 says, notice how clearly God spells it out. The reason why Israel was asked to obey was an outgrowth of the fact that God, that God had already redeemed them. Nowhere does scripture give any indication that God ever asks people to obey as a condition to redemption, as a condition, okay? That's another important thing that we need to remember when we are talking to people who are just getting in the know about God and how does this Christianity work and what is the Bible and I don't understand how, what, how prayer, you know, how are you supposed to pray? There's people that uh, don't have all of that information. Doesn't mean they're evil people, they're great people. They're nice to talk to, they're fun to be with. But they don't, they don't know all those things about a relationship with God, they're ignorant. So we need to be careful and we need to be tender um, and not expect them, well, before you come to Christ, you got to know about the Ten Commandments and obey them all. Then you can come to Christ. And not until then. <laughs> Can't do that. That's not the way it works. Number 18. What is the Old Testament motive for obeying God? Thou shalt what? Love the Lord thy God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. It starts in the heart. And from our heart, Love springs upwards towards God, right? Love. Okay, let's uh, go through these texts in the Bible. John 13, 34. Let's do this. John 13, 34. Oh, I know that one. I know 13, 34. Uh, John 13, 34. It says there, um, and, th and the world will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Right? A new commandment, no, you're right. Let's, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Oh, I was quoting verse 35. <laughs> the next one. Okay? And then Leviticus 19.18. Leviticus 19.18 says this. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I can just hear God saying that. Hey guys, don't bear a grudge against people. You hear him saying that? Don't, don't be so vindictive. Don't bear grudges, but love others as you love yourself. Please, don't bear grudges against each other. Forgive one another. And that's in the Old Testament. That's Old Testament language. And then Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Matthew 22, 30, 30, uh, 36. I'm not going to read them all, but it says this. Verse 36 says, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus himself is saying. You can just hear the pleading in his voice. All right, number 19, question 19. Was, was Old Testament religion a legalistic religion? I've always liked this verse, Micah 6, 8, and it says this. What does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Okay. These things do not come naturally. <laughs> These things do not come easily, always. To love mercy means loving, revealing, and demonstrating a, a, a holistic love for those who do you wrong. Because for those who do you right, what's the purpose of mercy? You don't need mercy in those cases, do you? But you need to show mercy because indicative of just saying that is that somebody did you wrong. 
somebody did you wrong or somebody did somebody whom you love wrong. So God is saying here, um, be fair, do what is right and be fair with everybody. Okay. Be fair with everybody. And when somebody does you wrong, don't be vindictive, be merciful. And don't think you're all that. Be humble. Walk humbly with me. This is what God is saying. And in fact, before these words, what does the Lord require of thee? Before these words, it says here, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. He has shown you, it says over here. That's what that verse says, Micah 6, 8. Okay, um, we're going to skip these in the interest of time. Number 20. Was the new birth experience also an Old Testament experience? Well, look at what Ezekiel 36 says. A new heart also will I give you, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall, fall, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So God is all interested in renewing what's in here, not just what we don't say or what we don't do, what's in here. And in fact, some people may think, you may have thought this, that when Paul talks about, hey, we need to be circumcised in the heart. Paul says this in Romans, Galatians, we need to be circumcised of the heart. You know where he got that idea from? From Moses. Circumcision of the heart is expressly stated as that in Leviticus. In Moses, uh, I don't remember where they are, it's, it's, I have it in my other Bible, um, but um, it was preached back then. You know, take care of what's in here. Take care of what's in here. Number 21. Does God, His law, or His plan of salvation ever change? Nope. I am the Lord. The Bible says, I change not. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Um, you, can, you can bank on that. Jesus is not going to change from one era and then a few thousand years later. He's grown up a little bit. He's matured. He's gotten wiser. And so he's a little different. He's going to treat you a little different. <laughs> that's, that's not Jesus. So here's the gospel. If you only believe, that's 50% of it. If you only obey, that's 50% of it. Believing and obeying, and it's all based on grace. It's always, always based on grace. Okay? Okay. So, let's finish up tonight. Are you thankful that God has an eternal and changeless law? Are you thankful for that? Amen. I am. I hate change. <laughs> yeah. So does God. Now, there's no need for change. We need to change, but God has no need to change His laws because it's perfect. Are you th His moral law. Are you thankful that He saves us by grace and then gives us power to keep his law through our relationship with him. Are you thankful for that? Yes. We must believe that Christ is power over ourselves. We must believe that. I'm still doing a Daniel challenge. Today's day 15, 14. Yeah, I overate a little bit today, but I haven't eaten sweets. Oh, I ate one little sweet thing the other day. Call the. Uh oh. Yeah. Let's 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 keep on doing the Daniel challenge. Yeah, let's keep on doing it. Okay, to sum it up, what have we learned from tonight's lesson? That God is love, evidently. I mean, obviously, God is only one plan of salvation on both Old and New Testaments. God's law is unchangeable, His moral law, because some of His laws did change. In fact, Hebrews has language such as. The old covenant was not perfect. Um, it was done away with, etc., etc. But it's talking about the old system of connecting with God. That old system was that sandbox illustration that we call sanctuary. That was the old system. We don't connect with God through rituals in a sanctuary anymore. We connect with Him through a person, through Jesus Christ, our high priest. And so there were things that did change because the, the Messianic age, when Jesus came, just turned everything uh, around, everything around. 
everything. Um, so there were some laws, ceremonial laws that changed, uh, but God's moral law is unchangeable. The law does not save, it shows us how desperately we need God's grace. The law informs, but it doesn't transform. So don't try and transform yourself by obedience to the law. You'll be the most miserable of Christians, I promise. Okay, so here's future topics. We're going to talk about judgment, three phases of judgment. We're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus and the rapture. I alluded to it a little bit in a, a couple of weeks ago. We're going to talk about the millennium. I know Carlos was interested in the millennium. We're going to be talking about that. And we're going to talk about death. And uh, all of these things are in Daniel, or it's alluded to. If you really think about it, then uh, you end up uh, studying some of these things. Okay, so tomorrow morning's lesson. Remember, tomorrow morning and at 2 o'clock, right? No. no. Yes, right. <laughs> okay. So just tomorrow morning at 11, and uh, so we'll give you your lessons. Anybody have any questions or comments? Nope. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go straight to bed, go home, because I need it. Yeah, I'm like concentrating right now. <laughs> you did good. Okay, no questions? All right. Well, then, why don't we all stand then, and let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for your holy law and how it's um, solid as a rock not only literally, but spiritually. We're thankful, God, that you don't change because that would be pandemonium. We're thankful that we can come to you, our anchor, our rock, our fortress, unmovable, and that your law reveals what is right and wrong, that great uh, line between right and wrong. And Lord, we do understand that we need your grace because we mess up. We break your law, Lord, and we mess up. We don't want to, Lord. We sincerely don't want to. We do want to be obedient. We do want to be perfect. But we need your help and we need your grace and the filling in our thoughts and our hearts of your Holy Spirit. Help us to be humble, to be merciful, and uh, to do what is right and just. And help us, Lord, to always have faith in your grace, not in our obedience, in your grace, to lead us to obedience. Thank you for blessing us tonight. Take care of us, Lord, please, as we go home and give us a good night's rest. We ask these things in your beautiful and holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.